Okay, here we are. This is um, your final section test, and I'm just recording a quick video, um, which mimics all of the previous videos uh, regarding these tests. So, um, section test number three, due Thursday, August 25th by 11.55 p.m. That's five minutes to midnight. It's not 5 p.m. like the other ones. It's five minutes to midnight. All of your other um, assignments are due then to your writing project. The forum closes on the last day of classes, which is, pull out my calendar here, um, boop, 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 last day of classes, classes end on the 20th, so tomorrow. Um, at 10 p.m., the writing project proposal forum comes down, so uh, that's last call for that 5%. Um, I mark that pass or fail. Did you do it or did you not? Um, and as a favor, I'd like you to sort of um, it, it sort of comment on other people's too so that everybody gets the full value of um, that as well. So um, policies here. Missed assignment policy. Let me know within 12 hours of the deadline or due date if you hope to have an extension. It requires an, a conversation. That's all. Um, few of you have uh, been granted extensions this semester and you know I'm very willing to work with you. Um, assignment submission. Make sure that um, your proper document, your complete document is properly submitted to Moodle. Uh, it's your responsibility to get these to me. Um, I just grade what I have um, and uh, there is an absolute zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. If you're using any of those online resources that are out there, um, first off, I should warn you, I know them all. I know that it's, I've seen them. I've been doing this a long time. I know them all. So um, it's, it, they, you know, their terminology that just jumps out at me that comes off so-and-so summary on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something along those lines. You're, you're not going to be able to get it past me. Right. So um, anything that you use that doesn't come directly from the text. And in fact, if you're quoting from the text, you should reference the text. Um, my videos, the supplementary videos. And again, if you're quoting or referring to those, you should reference those. Um, it has to be referenced. Right. So if you go on Wikipedia or Gradesaver or Sparknotes or something along those lines, I don't advise it because I, I, I spin this material in a particular kind of way to fit sort of an, a, a conceptual arc that I've been building all semester. So um, so and so's general summary of this is not necessarily going to be the most handy reference for you. But nonetheless, um, if you do decide to use that, you have to reference it. Uh, and I'm sort of a tough cop on this. So um, familiarize yourself with the OU policies and the course policy, which is you fail the course if I catch you doing it. So um, that's that's the policies. Um, so uh, the books are Kierkegaard, the essential Kierkegaard. It's just that one sickness unto death um, section that we've gone through, and we focus mostly on the first paragraph of it, actually. Um, so you've got video material on that. You've got the text. Um, and you've got a series of questions on that, uh, two of them on this test. And then Frederick Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. That's Beyond Good and Evil, it is, right? Um, so uh, actually, it's, it's, I'm, I'm finishing off a dissertation. Um, it, it, it lo loosely centered around Nietzsche and myself um, right now. So this is sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, so uh, you've got a lot of video material with regard to both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and um, you're responsible for not only the readings but the video material as well. So um, short answer questions. Um, I'm looking for a paragraph or two for each response. Um, on the last test a few of you uh, were giving general summaries, short general summaries, and those got part grades. Make sure to answer the question completely. If you need the second paragraph, use the second paragraph. Um, at full sentences, point form responses, I have to interpret, and your job is to communicate clearly in writing um, about these ideas, about these concepts, about these problematics that I'm isolating here. So um, point form doesn't do the trick. You've got to use sentences and proper punctuation and uh, make your case as clearly as possible, um, which is to say just 
show me what you know, right? Um, you've done the work. Um, I hope you've done the work anyway. And um, if you've done the work, you should have some sort of understanding. It's just a matter of letting that shine through in your writing. Okay, so five questions. Um, it, it's, I'm sort of wordy in this um, do, 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 do sort of thing. Uh, the first one uh, regarding Kierkegaard refers to um, Roderick's uh, claim that um, despair right, is not a mood problem. Right? Um, and what I'm asking you about this is a couple of things. Why is this sort of existential despair not a mood problem? And Roderick identifies the first sort of not yet despair and um, uses the example of zombie movies to explain what it is. Um, the second part of that question, I want you to discuss this sort of not yet despair in those zombie terms. Um, so what might this have to do with zombie movies? Um, I quite like Roderick's sort of characterization of it. I've considered actually basing a course in introductory philosophy around philosophy and zombies. It would mean something different for Plato, for Aristotle, for Kant, for, um, in fact, Hobbes and um, all of these figures and Kierkegaard fits neatly into this package. So, um, two things. Um, why is despair not a mood problem? And discuss that first type of not yet despair. Second question, discuss, uh, and Kierkegaard discusses two sorts of despair in the strict sense, and that's um, from page 351 of The Essential Kierkegaard. Um, <clears throat> they are and not to will to be oneself and despair to will to be oneself, and I know they look very similar, but um, what I want you to do is introduce each of these and distinguish between them, right? How is despair not to will to be oneself and despair to will to be oneself, right? How are they distinct and in what sense are they structurally similar? Right? So uh, four points for that. And that's Kierkegaard. Right? Now, um, oh, <laughs> This is, this is the book that I use when I teach my other class. Where is my, okay, we'll go for my old rickety copy of The Portable Nietzsche, my well-thumbed version um, with it held together by packing tape and, um, you know, with pages that fall out at me. That's right, because we're talking about Twilight of the Idols. I like Twilight of the Idols. It's one of Nietzsche's later works, and it's as... Um, critical as Nietzsche gets, right? Um, oh, I'm not sure that's true, but nonetheless, it is a wealth of critical Nietzsche, right? So um, we're just looking at a very small selection of Twilight of the Idols. Keep reading. It's an absolutely fascinating read um, where Nietzsche's inversions and critiques are just very incisive, right? So um, in Twilight of the Idols, in section two of the problem of Socrates, Nietzsche makes the following claim. One must stretch, uh, by all means, stretch out one's fingers and make uh, the attempt to grasp this amazing finesse that the value of life cannot be estimated. Well, what does Nietzsche mean by this? That's four points. All right. So um, what I'm looking for is a fairly deep analysis of that claim. Right. Judgments of value are just that. Judgments. What do they exhibit? What don't they? You know conclude, right? So um, Nietzsche in this section is actually making a fairly, fairly revolutionary claim about, you know, philosophers who make claims about the value of life. I'll just quickly read um, do, 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 uh, the passage here. Here we go. Okay, so this is page 474. Uh, judgments, judgments of value concerning life for it or against it can, in the end, never be true. They have value only as symptoms. They're worthy of consideration only as symptoms in themselves. Such judgments are stupidities. One must by all means stretch out one's fig fingers and make it the attempt to grasp this amazing finesse that the value of life cannot be estimated, not by the living, for they're an interested party even a bone of contention and not judges. 
not by the dead for a different reason. For a philosopher to see a problem in the value of life is thus an objection to him, a question mark concerning his wisdom and unwisdom. Indeed, are these great men, um, all these great uh, wise men? They were only uh, decadence, but not wise at all. I return to the problem of Socrates. All right, so um, right off the bat, what Nietzsche is trying to critique with this statement is um, the disposition behind the judgment that would say that life is no good. Right? Because really a judgment of value, he's presenting a judgment of value that life is great or life sucks as something that is evidence of a disposition rather than a statement with truth value. All right, so um, this question number three asks you to analyze that position. I find it fascinating. I think it's um, a really powerful mode of critique um, my work relies on. Question number four, here's Roderick again. Roderick, while discussing the, uh, the paradox of interpretation raised by Nietzsche claims, it's crucially important in the political economy of the university to try to deny Nietzsche's insight for this reason, if it is one. Nietzsche, uh, uh, Rick Roderick, Nietzsche as myth and myth maker, 1991, you've got the Moodle link for that. Uh, briefly discuss this issue. So what I need you to do is go into the Roderick video and isolate and discuss the argument that Nietzsche is making. Right? He's making an argument about getting to the right interpretation and standards of interpretation. Um, it's really sort of a fascinating kind of point that actually builds out of um, the judgment about life point as well. So um, uh, the first two Nietzsche questions sort of relate to one another, but nonetheless, um, in number four, follow Roderick's argument. I think it's a rather clever appraisal of interpreting Nietzsche. And then finally, um, one of my favorite sections of Twilight of the Idols in your portable Nietzsche um, called Morality is Anti-Nature. In this section, Nietzsche presents a rather damning criticism of Christian morality, claiming that this form of morality turns hostily against the passions, or is an attempt to kill the passions. At one point, he likens it to castration. Um, it, here, uh, the alternative Nietzsche proposes is the spiritualization of passion. Right. Um, Nietzsche 487, actually in the first um, section of morality is anti-nature, he refers to the spiritualization of passion as well, uh, for which he gives us two examples, love and hostility. He doesn't discuss love much, but it should be clear, and you've got the basis in Plato um, to be able to um, flesh out that example in Nietzsche, um, enmity or hostility. Uh, is the example he does flesh out quite a bit. Um, I believe in the video, um, I liken it to playing golf with my friend who's not a very good golfer. What happens? I play down to him, right? Or playing a video game, like it's I shoot bots, right? I don't play a whole lot online. Um, but nonetheless, when you're really into the video game, it's because it's presenting you with a challenge and it energizes you and asks you to develop new capacities and that sort of thing. But when you beat the game, it just kind of loses its value. Right? So uh, what Nietzsche is trying to get us to do is sort of spiritualize, think through, um, refine, hone, is sort of capture and mobilize our passions towards life-affirming ends, right? So um, briefly discuss how Nietzsche uses these passions as a, an examples of a triumph over the prevailing form of morality, which um, he, um, in the, I believe it's the first section of morality is anti-nature, um, do, 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 do. Um, one must kill the passions. Uh, let me see, where is it? Yeah, here it is, um, page 486. There, uh, there it is said, for example, with particular, particular reference to uh, sexuality, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Fortunately, no Christian acts in accordance with this precept, destroying the passions and cravings, 
merely as a preventative measure and measure against their stupidity and unpleasant consequences of this stupidity. Today, this strikes itself as a, merely another for, acute form of stupidity. We no longer admire dentists who pluck out teeth because they hurt anymore. Right. So, um, it largely what Nietzsche is claiming is that it, traditionally we've regarded a passion that, that becomes problematic as something to oppose and destroy. Right. And uh, very early on in the argument in Twilight of the Idols, um, he claims that Socrates was guilty of this, turning reason into a tyrant to become absurdly rational at all costs. Right. Well, what Nietzsche is suggesting as an alternative to this is a spiritualization of passion, right? And a sort of harnessing of the power of that passion and directing it towards a good goal. Um, it, you know, oddly at this point, Nietzsche it, it starts to sound a bit like Plato, if you remember the love dialogue, right? It's it's raw desire, the 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 the, the dark horse, the impetuous part of the soul, uh, you know, wasn't per se bad. It was just impetuous and made us do stupid, foolish, wrong-headed, nasty, jerky kind of things, right? So for Plato, he would use reason to restrain and retrain and redirect that aspect of the soul, which is a, a passion or a form of desire, right? Which is how he's able to argue that love can potentially be a beneficial form of madness. Well, um, Nietzsche is up to something similar here, but largely um, he rejects reason as the big standard. He's not saying be irrational, but he is arguing that turning reason into a commander, right, into a tyrant, right, is another symptom of that problem. What he's suggesting here is address passion on passion's terms. Right. So um, I look forward to reading uh, your your responses to these questions. Um, this last section is always sort of interesting for me. Um, it's, it, it's sort of the more current-ish philosophy, uh, current-ish 137 years ago or something like that. Um, it, it's funny how philosophers treat current sources kind of thing. But um, nonetheless, it's it's I, I get a kick out of this this theory it's 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 my bag so um it's i i like to to read responses in um this section of the class um also i very much look forward to reading your writing assignments i've hope uh, i hope you've all gotten an early start on them the idea is pick two philosophers one of the questions and use those two philosophers to address one of those questions yourself taking aside the debate about how best to address the question um, along with those philosophers. So um, the writing assignment is where you put yourself in dialogue with the history of Western philosophy. And this is a, sort of a short writing assignment, but nonetheless, um, uh, part of our writing intensivity, right? So this is your opportunity to really make your own argument, um, it, which I don't know if you're like me, I find that fun. Um, so, uh, thank you for the course. Um, I look forward to reading all of your final materials. Please let me know, as always, if you have any questions about anything pertaining to the content, pertaining to the materials in the course, um, pertaining to how you were assessed, pertaining to structure of assignments. If you're just stuck in writing and need a push, um, let me know. And um, I'm here and ready to help. All right. Have a good day is one for each of you.